Welcome to the Values Exchange Podcast. I'm Mike Cruz, your host, private pilot, author of Saturday Every Day, and CEO of North Texas Wealth Management, a firm dedicated to values-based financial planning. This podcast uncovers the values and habits of highly successful people and dives into how it has shaped their success and what you can learn from their personal stories. Well, thanks for uh, joining joining me for another episode of the Values Exchange podcast. To say that I'm excited today for our, our guest is an understatement. Um, e- extremely uh, honored to have David Rutherford here. I mean, national speaker, former uh, Navy SEAL instructor for the CIA, performance coach of like world class. And, you know, if that's not nerve wracking enough that, you know, he could just come over and choke me out if he wanted to, right? <laughs> um, the fact that he's had, you know, a, a podcast of, um, you know, a huge amount of followers and, and YouTubers with millions of views, uh, just, a, just a great guy with a lot of information. Uh, David, thanks for being here. Mike, thank you so much for having me. It's a a real pleasure and also a pleasure to have all you in the audience as well, too. I I don't traditionally have an audience with any podcasts I've ever been on, so this is really cool. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, today, you know, every episode I I focus on a different value. And today I want to focus on like the value of embracing fear. Mm. And, you know, I wanted to highlight on on the podcast always really the measures that, you know, that key components that it takes to be be successful Mm -hmm. and kind of pull those out from a value standpoint. And I think, you know, as I reflect, the number one thing that keeps people from reaching their goals, from finding success is usually fear, fear of failure, fear of injury. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we just have this natural tendency towards fear. And I know you know a lot about the subject. (laughs) A little bit, for sure, for sure. So when you think about that, when I say embracing fear, what, what does that really mean to you with all this vast experience that you've had? Wow, that's a great place to start. Um, I think, you know, fear is an interesting thing because out of the eight core emotions that we process on a daily basis, and obviously you can subset and go down as deep as you want down the rabbit hole of those emotions, but fear is, is the quintessential emotion to me, right? All decisions that we make every single day, day in and day out, are a result of an emotional charge no matter what and people all out there say no I'm, it's it's just business or don't take it personally or what ah, all nonsense right we make decisions based on emotion and one of the primary emotions that we have to face and deal with every day is emotions that are dealing with fear and so you know i think a lot of people when they first want to talk about fear they they talk about fear of failure or fear of not of being rejected or fear of being isolated. So they, they, they compartmentalize the, the emotion with, with uh, another concept, right? Where, where I like to start is just understanding fear itself. So, okay. you know, it, it, how, how do you think the most fear affects you in the most significant way? What would you say? Yeah, I think, um... I mean, it can manifest itself differently, but a lot of times just physical, just hand sweating. There you go. And just. And so that comes from where? Your limbic system, right? In, mm-hmm. the, in, the, in the oldest region of your brain, right? The earliest developed part of your brain is your limbic system. You've got these two beautiful little things in there called the amygdalas, right? Uh, and unless I take a, 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 a saw and crack open your donut and a little ice cream scooper and pop those suckers out, you're going to have fear. You're wired for fear, right? Along with the hippocampus, that's what produces stress hormones every single day. So whether you're driving down the highway out here where someone cups you off and immediately you want to shoot your hand out or start screaming through the window, what? Your fear triggers and what those negative stress hormones start, Mm -hmm. adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then cortisol. So automatically heart rate goes up, palms start sweating, blood goes from your into your major muscle groups, away from your digestive region, right, into your core heart. For what? For that fight or flight. So just on a physiological level, fear is an inescapable reality. So anytime you ever hear anybody talk about, oh, this person was fearless, you know what I say to all that? I say 
there's no way it doesn't yeah. exist. It just, we are riddled with fear no matter what. We're, we're wired for it. And then the other component is that you've been taught fear your whole lives. I, I have four daughters, right? And, and every time I get to drop my daughters off at school and I'm home and I'm not on the road, I have them recite these 22 different missions, right? And so mission number one is, is, is uh, safety first, fear, right? Mission number four is don't go near strangers, fear. Hell, mission number 13 is embrace your fear, right? So I'm constantly teaching them to be in some capacity and in some metric through their value hierarchies, mm -hmm. afraid of the world that's out there, right? To create a protective analysis that keeps them in a, in a healthy space where they can operate within their framework of reality. So fear on a fundamental level is so ingrained into how we see the world that it's inescapable. So once you come to that realization that no matter what, or, or, that's not entirely true. I, I have found a couple case studies out there where people had traumatic brain injuries or they, had, uh, they were born with underdeveloped amygdalas or some other region of their brain where you, you could put them in a situation where they didn't, uh, they didn't have the same reaction to fear as, po as most normal people do. So there are people out there, but the overwhelming majority mm -hmm. of people around the world, and it doesn't matter your, what culture, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your race, none of that. The human structure in your, in your, in your brain has fear built into it. And, and that's, I mean, some interesting uh, thing that they found um, a couple of summers ago, some um, neurologists discovered that you actually have a, a, a dedicated wire circuit in your brain out of your 80 million synopsis, right? Um, there's a dedicated wire specifically for snakes. Hmm. And so when you think about, my God, every time I see a snake, you're like, ah! you know, you're up here like this. You don't even think about it. You just react, right? Yeah. Or you, you, you know, you hear the rattle going or whatever it might be. You just, your body reacts and goes into a, a, a reaction that's outside of your, your cognitive control, right? It's your limbic system overriding your prefrontal cortex. That wiring is roughly estimated to be 30 to 40 million years old. And so mm -hmm. when you start to think about that, how that part of your brain works, man, fear is a part of us. And so the idea for me, when I came up with the idea of, and you can't defeat fear, you can't conquer fear, you can't be fearless. So for me, it was, all right, what's the core ignition point for the human condition to develop on that pathway towards discovering what your purpose is in life? And it started with learning to embrace your fear. That's how it started. Okay. So when you talk about embracing your fear, I mean, I think of it as, you know, sometimes, you know, it's not as extreme as, as being a Navy SEAL, but that's a great example of, you know, real fear, right? Fear that, you know, something happens to you, life or death, something happens to a teammate. How do you, how do you push past that? Well, that's a great question too. I, you know, first let's, let's just break down those analogies a little bit. So I have four daughters, like I said, I've, I've been way more afraid having four daughters than I ever was, you know, on a battlefield, right? The, the uncertainty of how your child is going to evolve or mm -hmm. who they're going to become friends or who they're going to date. My 15 year old has a boyfriend now and that's some scary stuff, right? But, you know, and, and people are like, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, you went to combat, you, you, you know, you had people shoot at you, you, you jumped out of airplanes in the middle of the night. Yeah, but what, there's a concept called stress inoculation. And so through our training program, which I believe is one of the most sophisticated programs on the planet that teaches you to embrace fear at the highest levels, th through every day, you are exposed to fear at a higher, high degree a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Well, just like in anything in our lives, over time, we develop a, um, it's not a complacency, it's, and it's, it's more along the lines of an acceptance of its presence in our, in our desires, right? I know if I want to do this thing, fear is gonna be present in whatever the sequence to, be, to get to that level where I, right, this mm -hmm. is the desired outcome, this is the stated goal. And so for me, it was, not only going through the training, but then going in, into a platoon, and then it was deploying into a war zone. So that was the sequence. Well, for me, that sequence took almost four and a half, no, to go to combat. I mean, my first platoon, we weren't even in combat. It was, I uh, deployed in 2000. 
but I did do a, a, another platoon and the teams went to Afghanistan. So that was almost six and a half years of training prior to even going into that. So think about that mm -hmm. amount of exposure to those different levels of fear. Over time, you learn to mainly through a, a concept called rote conditioning, right? I, you know, in this situation, we model different combat environments and we practice and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice to where we can perform those basics as close to perfection as possible under duress. That creates stress inoculation, which enables us to embrace our fear a little bit better than most other people. Hmm. So somebody that's trying to take that next step, whether it's start a business, leave their job, start a new job, uh, jump out of an airplane, mm -hmm. that fear comes in. What does that process look like um, to just like push past it? How do you- I, I don't you, think you ever do push past, but there, there is a process to this. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, after two years of research and fear and then looking and speaking to, I don't even know how many of my friends at every level from the tier yeah. one units all the way down and across from Green Berets to Rangers to MARSOC to Olympians to athletes and everything mm -hmm. in between. I, you know, I think for me, the first key is to understand your fear, to search for the truth of your fear. And so that really is the first sequence. So when I give my Embrace Fear lecture or I teach the course and, or people take it online, you know, in mission number one, there's five different missions, is, is to search for the truth of your fear. And step one is, 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 a, is a, just a, an exercise that I think most people have never done. And I'll take a little, little, little survey yeah. here for the crowd. So how many of all of you in the course of your lives have sat down and written down every single fear you've ever had? Fear when you were a little child, fear when you were in adolescence, fear in your young adult, fear in your jobs, and then also every fear you have in the future. Has anybody in the room ever done that? Not a single one of them. Have you ever done it? No. So I remember in one of the first times I gave this uh, presentation, I was in front of about a thousand people in, at, a, at a space in South Florida. And I asked this question and three people in the entire crowd raised their hand. And I said, all right, you know, was it a college course or was it your therapist? And, <laughs> and two were college courses and one was their therapist, therapist right? right? I just did it for a, a big group uh, down in uh, Hollywood, Florida recently. It was probably about 90 people and one person raised their hand and, and he had done it going through AA, right? And that's okay. one of the things. So, so when you think about your fear, and, and I'm willing to bet you'll acknowledge if, you know, that it's one of the most significant uh, inhibitors, right, of, of, re of, Real, the realization of our, our desired potentiality, right? Fear is what gets in our way. But if you don't understand your fear, if you don't even know what you're afraid of and why, man, you can't even go down that road. Mm -hmm. So for me, the first real component is learning to understand what you're afraid of, how it makes you react physiologically, cognitively, emotionally, and even spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even walking into this interview today, getting the opportunity to, to sit with you, you know, nerves set in a little bit. And I wasn't nervous about what I would say or, you know, being on up here with you. I think I'm nervous that I have this opportunity. Yeah. And I'm going to miss asking the right questions to like seize that opportunity. And mm -hmm. so sometimes for me, it's that processing the fear of what's the worst case scenario? What am I really afraid of? And then, okay, go do your homework and make sure you preparation. ask the right questions. Yeah, right? preparation. I think, yeah. you know, preparation is, is one of the key components of it. Um, I think, you know, one of the ideas, though, first, when you get to understand your fear, what I've seen, what happens with people, then it, it can actually intensify their fears because nobody's ever really dug in. And now all of a sudden you, you see you have these real core fundamental fears. For, for me, I had a fear of death that started very early on at 13 years old. Um, and so that was a key component for me when I made the decision to want to go into the SEAL program, into the teams, because I thought if I could go and do this, that I would be able to confront death with as little amount of fear, you know, stand toe to toe, do what I needed to do and come out of it unscathed. Well, that was, a, you know, it, uh, it was delusional to imagine that, but I was a young kid and I didn't know what I was doing at the time. But the reality really is, is that I didn't, I hadn't spent enough time understanding death. I hadn't spent enough time trying to uh, recognize that death is the ultimate construct of, of, of 
our interpretation of our lives, right? There's finality in each one of us. And so how, is, is it possible that I could have absolved or minimized that fear by going down a more uh, um, uh, theological or metaphysical you know, pathway? Or, or did I actually physically needed to confront it? Well, I mean, who knows now that I made the choice I made to get there. Mm -hmm. What have I learned about that? A whole, a whole different component. And my point to say that is you might have a fear, but at some point, you know, if you want to achieve an objective, you have to figure out how to walk through that fear, walk mm -hmm. with that fear. And that's how I kind of always want to reference it. That's why I like I embrace it, right? Put your arms around it, lock onto it, wrestle it at first, and then get used to it, and then mm -hmm. turn it in, put it in your giant rucksack of life, and, and march on. Yeah. So I think that's, that's really the idea of preparation, um, understanding, and then acceptance is, is, an, is, in my opinion, the next real big part, part of it. Okay. So in your experience, like in Af Afghanistan, can you kind of, what I'd like to do is go through kind of one of these extreme environments mm -hmm. and then maybe pivot to the business world and sure. le I'd say less extreme environments. So kind of where did you find yourself where like fear set in, you had to kind of go back to that training. What was, what did that look like for you? What was that experience? Well, I, I you know, my, when I first got to Afghanistan, it was the uh, end of May, 2002. So not even a year after 9-11 and I had this profound fear of getting blown up. Uh, there were 25 million landmines still in the country. If mm -hmm. you aggregated every other country with landmines, Afghanistan still had double the amount of landmines. So they were everywhere because the Russians had just carpeted the country with, with, with mines. And so I had this fear, which was a logical fear. Obviously, we were driving yeah. around in dune buggies. I, you know, I didn't want to drive over an anti-tank mine, and, and that would be it. And, and, and so this fear began to get a hold of me, and it began to impede on my logical interpretation of, of, of the tactics that would make, that would lower or reduce that sensation of fear. And so for about 30 days, I really struggled. I really struggled a lot with this. It was almost a paralysis. So I'd have a moment about doing an op where I was like, all right, we'd plan it, we'd get ready, we'd go out, we'd be executing, something would go wrong. But all, always I'm like, is that a bomb? Is that a bomb? Is that a bomb? And what's interesting in, in Afghanistan is there's, there's no, there's, there were two paved roads in the whole place. So everything you're doing is you're driving off road. Well, the way they have street signs in Afghanistan is they make rock piles. Well, they also identify <laughs> mines with rock piles. So you're on a dirt road driving around and all of a sudden you're yeah. like, there's a rock pile. That's got to be a mine. Oh no, that's our turn, right? Okay. And so it, it, it created this the space for me where I really struggled to over overcome that. Luckily, I had some really great guys around me that I I shared my fear with them. They leaned in with me. They helped me kind of process it. Uh, they took my mind off it. They were always uh, whether it was a, a swim buddy that was that rode shotgun while I was driving, or it was a guy on patrol with, or there was always someone that you could lean to that would help you keep a rational interpretation of the fear. And I think that's a key component mm -hmm. of the human experience that a lot of people don't do. You know, when you when you learn to accept that fear is going to play a role in, in pretty much all outcomes, especially if you're putting if you're taking a risk and any risk you're going to take fear is present. Right. And pretty yeah. much waking up and going out into the world every day is a risk in some capacity. But if you have a, a person involved with you that can help be a backstop for what I call the uh, the illogical interpretation of fears, mm -hmm. right? Where you take something that is totally manageable, you blow it up because of, of, of the fear itself, but all the other affiliated concepts, right? To, to try and keep it contained, to be rational about it, um, and, 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 then to, and then to do the prep work around it that enables you to, to manage it and keep it in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a contained way. I think that that was really the best thing for me is to have assistance from other people because I knew they were afraid too but if we worked together we were able to manage our fears much more efficiently yeah. so it sounds like it's a balance of not necessarily becoming fearless 
It's just that saying, yeah, sense. I have a fear, but not, not make it where it immobilizes you. It becomes something bigger than it is. I've got one friend that was at a tier one unit and has something like close to 700 missions. I mean, think about that. I mean, it's yeah. a staggering, staggering amount. I mean, something like 15 straight years of combat this guy was involved in. And I remember asking him, I was going, hey, man, were, were, were you afraid at your last few deployments? And he looked at me and goes, Rut, what are you, an idiot? I was getting shot at. Of course I was afraid. Right? And you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Right? That, of course he's going to be afraid. Bullets are whizzing by his head. Yeah. People are shooting at him. They want to kill him. So, yeah, he's got the fear. But because his skill sets are so high and the people around him he has so much trust in, that he can execute in the midst of, of that, that, that probability of his own demise, right? Mm -hmm. By doing the things he was taught to do and has become a master at, you know, and that was really, you know, mm -hmm. he, had, he had essentially retrained his brain to where, where most of us, we, we get afraid, we're like, ah, you know, where he's like, you know, he'll lean into it, okay. hit, you know, but he'll be afraid, but he can, he learned to lean in because he had so, so much confidence and trust in himself and then his teammates. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, it, <clears throat> that piece of, you, you have fear. It's not Absolutely. That, and then learning to really like, like you said, lean in is, is such an important component. And I kind of think of it as, you know, whether it's, you know, doing something extreme you've never done before. But I think there's this critical point where you're depending on somebody else. Yep. And then you reach that moment, maybe after all of that training, your first deployment and you're there. I mean, you had your teammates, but at some point it probably felt like, hey, you're, you're a little bit of a loan. This is your first deployment. How do you, at that moment, how do you make that decision, I guess, to go, all right, now it's time to trust myself and lean on it. Or you could retract, right? I mean, yeah, I, I think for everybody, it, it, and this is the really interesting thing about the human condition, right? The, 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 emotions, the emotions go across the spectrum of people, no matter where you're from, what culture mm -hmm. or anything, right? So that's always there. The, the unique aspect is the timing, right? The, the temporal perception of fear for each individual is in a different timing space. Mm -hmm. So you and I, let's say, hey, Mike, let's go jump out of airplane, right? You, have you ever done that? I've not done that. All right, so you, we're gonna get, you're gonna be like, yeah, this is gonna be really cool. We're gonna get out there, you're gonna get in the course and they're gonna be teaching you and your, your fear level is gonna grow and grow. Mine will be getting a little bit here, a little bit here, right? And yours, we're gonna be like, you're gonna get on your, your suit and like yours is now right here and mine's still kind of here. And, and then, you know, we get in the plane, right? And now yours is gonna spike through the roof. Mine will get a little bit higher. The door opens and now you're pegged. You're like, oh my God, I'm about ready to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. This is yeah. not good, right? What am I doing? I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about my kids. And I'm like, all right, this is awesome. <laughs> and then you're like, ah, why are we know, doing this? Why are yeah. we doing this? Yeah. And, and so again, it, it comes to that ability to rationalize your decision and manage the presence of that. And I think what it is, it's 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 like I said, it's retraining your brain to put the positive emotion next to the negative emotion, right? And that's, that's a challenging thing for people to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, the more trauma people have been exposed to, it's really difficult. So what you do is you, you have this negative emotion, but then you, you learn to override it with the positive emotion that can mm -hmm. buttress against it. And then when you get real good, that positive emotion cannot almost consume it, minimize it, actually essentially compartmentalize it, and then keep you focused on just the the coolness of jumping out of an airplane right it's yeah. really fun it, it's it's a, a it's, it's it's an incredible experience it's freeing you know all of those really unique aspects of that mm -hmm. action take place then you hit the ground and you're like oh thank you very much and you're like wow what now i have this experience and then the net if you were to do it again what would happen it's a little bit more it's more minimized because now you have an expectation of what's going to happen too, because fear of the unknown is one of the primary focuses of, mm -hmm. of of what drives that that seeming uncontrolled fear, where it just gets the better of you. Yeah, and I think having that higher purpose or goal. Yeah. Um, now you're talking. Is is another way to like stay positive and saying, yep. hey, I want my you know I don't want to jump out of an airplane. Something happened to me and my kids, 
But the other way to look at it is to say, if I jump out of the airplane, that's going to encourage them to take certain risk and experience life and live life to the fullest. Absolutely. And it kind of elevates your ability to go, yeah, I need to do this, yeah. right? Well, think about it. I mean, when we think about our, our self-consciousness, there's this perpetual motivational war taking place in us every single day, right? And it's taking place as a result of our external perceptions of reality, right? If, if you see uh, troubling things externally coming at you, I call it the negative insurgency, right? Man, you have to process that. You're constantly figuring out solutions. You're, you're, gauge, you're putting it in the different a priori hierarchies of, 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 of what you're going to have to face and at what time. And then over here, you have the other side of that, which is your own internal negative mm -hmm. insurgency going, man, I shouldn't do this. I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not attractive enough. I'm, you know, all of these things these, uh, with insecurities that take place normally within all human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you, you know, you're a dedicated narcissist in some capacity. I think they don't have as many struggles, but they have struggles in other places, right? Social interaction. Yeah. But, you know, for most human beings, it's that battle. It's that war taking place over what is going to be the motivation, the motivate, I call it triggers, right? The motivational trigger that you pull that gets you that one step further, that one mm. step further. Now, some people, maybe it would take them going to the airstrip or, or, or doing something adventurous 20 times before they finally cross the threshold. Some other people do it in one time, right? And I think a lot of it is an interpretation of, of things that have made you afraid in the past and how you've conquered them. Mm -hmm. Or the courage, the courage with which you've addressed fear in the past. It's really about courage. Yeah. Well, I was hoping you were going to come in today and tell us the secrets of not being fearful. <laughs> uh, uh, so there, there are some, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is testing yourself, and that's kind of the next process, right? Once okay. you retrain your brain to, to analyze or to assess and understand your fear in, in your own unique way, um, the next one is to test yourself. And so what I recommend when I deal, I'll give you a perfect example. I was working with a CEO um, of a, a, who ran a couple hospitals up in, um, in the Midwest, and, and he had some fears about management style, right? Being too hard and coming down in some capacities uh, mm -hmm. on his staff. Um, because there was such a diversification of the staff, right? From a doctor to, you know, the uh, janitorial services to an ER nurse versus a critical care nurse, you know, all, okay. a lot of different personality types there going, so a lot to deal with. And so we, we drilled down and we did this exercise. We listed out his fear and one of his greatest fears ever was a, a real succinct phys physical fear, which was swimming. Because as a kid, he'd almost drowned in a lake incident. Hmm. And so he'd never learned to swim. So what do you think the first thing I did was, guess what? Uh, I want you to sign up for a, a one mile open water swim one year from today. And then he's like, why? I was like, because you're going to swim an open water swim. And he's like, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, your next step is you're going to go down to the local YMCA or the pool and you're going to learn how to swim there. And so he sent me a picture like two weeks later of him standing waist deep in the water in his swim trunks next to a bunch of five-year-olds. <laughs> and it was awesome. And, and here this guy yeah. is now all of a sudden embracing his fear, right? He's taking baby steps or whatever you want to talk. Yeah. And, he's, and he's doing the process a little bit at a time. Now, he ended up doing that and, and it made a huge impact on testing him, the idea of testing yourself. So tests are critical with us no matter what, right? whether we test ourselves cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, physically. I believe the physical aspect of testing yourself is the easiest way to, to almost aggregate and separate fear in a manageable way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I always have people, um, if their fear is a big problem, I always have people engage in one big physical challenge a year, whether it's running a marathon, running an ultra, half ultra, you know, going on a, a five day hike, doing a, a, a huge hunting stalk, uh, doing a big swim, uh, maybe a bike or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Those physical challenges uh, are really uh, quintessential in, in allowing us to deconstruct our interpretation of our fears. Because at, a, at our core, we're physical people, 
All, every human mm -hmm. being at our core, the way we function is through our physicality, right? Our, our interpretate, our temporal perception is relative to our space-time continuum. Um, our, our energy levels are a derivative of our sleep, right? Uh, our nutrition plays a major role in our cognitive ability, right? Uh, our interpretation of post past trauma allows us to see the world differently. So, and how we feel physical pain, right? So physicality is the ignition point, I believe, to begin down that road to where you can test yourself as it relates to your interpretation of fear. Hmm. That's interesting. I yeah. like that. And so kind of pivoting to these, uh, you know, not jumping out of the airplane <laughs> and, you know, a little bit of what you were just talking about. But I like the word that that you use a lot, which is team orientation. That's right. right. So at, at our company, Nortex Wealth Management, I view our ability to work as a team as a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. um, explain to me what you mean by like team orientation. How do you, how do you foster that? Yeah, there's, there's two different ideas within team orientation. Um, and, and I grew up playing sports. I started playing competitive sports at four years old. Mm -hmm. I played uh, lacrosse at Penn State, who, by the way, was in the NCAA tournament. Just want yeah. to say, who yeah, Penn State, nice. way to go. Nice. Jeff, great job. Um, <laughs> um, and so I always was a part of teams, but my real interpretation was limited to the, the estimation that my, my team orientation was a derivative of, of how skilled I was at, in the team. And I didn't see beyond that because of my youth. When I went into the SEAL teams, everything was just erased. Like they, they essentially took all of my ideas in, in an, in, it didn't eliminate them, but they, but they definitely put them at a, a, a much lower uh, place of, of, of relevance in terms of how a team operates. And so the first thing is to learn what it means to be a team member, a, a teammate, right? That's the key. If you have an individual that truly understands their responsibility as a team member, mm -hmm. now you're cooking, right? And, and the way I break down that is the four main ideas. And so, so a person has to be fundamentally committed to the team and whatever the team is doing, right? Um, if, if you have a, a, a participant on your team that is 50% in, it's 50% in, you're gonna, the, 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 those that limited, the self-imposed limitation of, of not being fully committed to the team, that you feel the effects, right? In particular, yeah. if their input is relative to a larger extent, right? Uh, where uh, they, they, their input is, is, is matched with other input to generate a system or a process that only happens with multiple people. You do have individual people that can play a major role that can have a singular effect, but it's rare. Most people's roles and responsibilities are, are correlated to others. And so that's mm -hmm. required that you have to understand what that commitment level, are you doing your best to be committed? I think the other aspect is training, right? Training okay. and what I've seen since 2008, most businesses, they simply do not have training programs in any of their, they're just not existent. Hmm. And so I'll walk into where, like if I came in and worked with your group, I'd say, all right, let me see how you guys train, how you train your new people, what's your weekly, what's your mm -hmm. quarterly training look like? How do you get everybody on the same sheet of music? What are the systems to evaluate training? And, and on, you know, most yeah. of the time I go in they're like, we don't have a training platform. We don't, we don't do regular training. We don't, if, if, if someone needs something on their resume, we maybe we'll pay for them to go to an outside course to get, you know, a, a bullet point on their, you know, their credentials, whatever it is. And I was like, okay, well, do, when that person comes back, do they integrate what they learned back into your team? They're like, no. So I'm like, okay, that, so training plays a big role. The okay. next one is communication. Um, you know, I think, People as individuals, there's an estimation far too often that, that it's the leadership that's the requirement for that high, high degree of communication capability, right? Mm -hmm. it, everything stems from you, what, how you communicate with everybody. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. But as, if I'm on your team, man, if I don't understand something and I'm not communicating that to you or to my superior or to someone else, that's on me. That's not your fault. And so learning to, to flip that around initially as being the good teammate is critical. And then the final part is leadership, right? Okay. So often I see with teams, one, leadership isn't clearly defined from the, from the top, 
But more importantly, the, the people on the bottom, they don't, they don't understand what it means to be a leader themselves within their own uh, subunit or their own group, right? How do I be the best possible person in, in let's say it's one of your analysts, right? Uh, or, or one of your junior advisors, right? Yeah. How do they maximize who they are as leaders for your firm, right? How do they, what is, how do they interact with your potential clients? How do they yeah. interact with, with other people, with the local accountants or with local law firms, right? How are they representing your firm? And, sure. and so a lot of that isn't very articulated or very mapped out for people, so leadership. And then what you do on, on the flip side is then you just turn the table and you say, as a leader, am I teaching my team this stuff? Okay. And, and what is, what is, what do, how are you embodying commitment, right? How do you demonstrate? Are you in the trenches with everybody? Are you staying and coming in on weekends? Are you, you know, staying after? Are you doing the networking yeah. function? Are you bringing the new business in, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what is the standard of your commitment? And then yeah. what's your training look like? And what's your communication capabilities? And what's your leadership look like, right? And so often, whether I'm working with a coach or I'm working with a CEO or I'm working with a player or I'm working with a junior advisor, you know, I, I get to that space and I'm like, well, you know, let's, let's just, let's just start with the most simplistic thing we could do. Let's all just sit around and define what great leadership is. And this is what I have teams do all the time. Let, let's just come in, you define it, you define it, you define it, you define it, I'll define it. And then what do we come out? We flip them over and then we all read, what are we going to get? We're going to get four different definitions of leadership. And that, people that's part of this right mm -hmm. is is people are not on the same sheet of music in, in with the same clear objectives and that that's in the seal teams we have that every single day every day we're everybody's a hundred percent aware of what the objective is for the day for the week for the month for the year and definitely for the deployment right mm -hmm. i mean de deployments are a little bit more fluid because the intelligence shifts, the enemy shifts, but so your 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 op, operational profile might change or shift. But the idea of how we collectively go about the the, the job at hand, man, that's clear and mm -hmm. it's mapped out. And I think a lot of times businesses just don't spend enough time on really helping the individual be a better teammate, and then also the leadership uh, to disseminate what they what they want that to look like. What they want it to look like. Yeah, that's that's great. So, um, and, and I guess in all your experience, where do you feel like, um, you know, this positivity? When I, when I kind of just Google your name and come <laughs> up, if I were to kind of put one word on it, I mean, there's so much that you're basically an expert on, but positivity keeps kind of boiling to the surface. So, like, where did that come from? What does that mean to you? I, you know, How did you develop that? I think always from a, an early age, um, uh, my my mom was always a real positive person. Right? She's just, you know, she doesn't spend a lot of time on the negative mm -hmm. aspects of things. She was a real significant competitor too. She was a state champion tennis player, and 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 so you know I saw that. And then my dad, you know, ran a big law firm and was always kind of the cheerleader for the firm and and kind of mm -hmm. held that managerial partner role at, at a high percent. So my my role models always kind of lived that they were involved in the community. They started charities there. So I'm, I'm always seeing my parents do that. And then, so I tried to manifest that in the, on the sports teams I played on and in school and stuff. But really it, for me, it, 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 it kind of um, manifested at, a, at the highest level when I went into buds um, because I realized real quick that uh, this was, I was way out of my talent league. Uh, I was not as hard as I thought I was. Uh, in fact, I was like a lot weaker than I thought I, uh, I would have been. Um, and I struggled immensely with the pain, the everyday pain, the, the, the physical pain of it, the mental pain of it. And so I, it took me a while, but once I figured out that, <laughs> once I figured out that if I, distract myself by trying to help you, then I forget about how much pain I'm in. And so my buddy, I, never, I had this one buddy, he was a horrible runner, right? Just, and when you get on that soft sand and you're covered in sand and you're soaking wet and you're, you're 
seven miles into a soft sand conditioning <laughs> run at four in the morning, four thirty in the morning, and you're miserable, and you see your buddy just who's in the goon squad. So the the pack would separate, and this back half would call. They'd call the goon squad, and and they would take additional beatings, like more push-ups and eight-count bodybuilders. They'd hit the surf, and they would just get a beat down. So every time this guy would go into the goon squad, he'd get slower and slower. So finally, what we would do is I would go out and I'd I'd take a, a rope and I'd tie it to his belt loop and I'd tie it to me and I'd run with him, dragging him, you know, along and be like, come on, you can do it. Or if someone else was struggling and on the O course or they were getting a beat down, I'd, I'd go and join them on the beat down. So I, I distracted my own misery by trying to help other people when they were in their misery. And so that really kind of cultivated this new mindset for me that that was a way I could I could almost uh, uh, minimize my own fear uh, by projecting a positivity for someone else that was struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and that seemed to help out a lot. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's, it's, it's very difficult to sustain. Um, and so there are many periods after that, yeah. I, you know, I would, I couldn't maintain it. I'd drop off and in some cases. Like when I left the teams, I battled depression for about three years because just the shift in lifestyle and the mentality. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I had those dark periods and then built it back up and then went through divorce, more dark period. And built, you know, met my new wife, built it back up. You know, so it's not as if, you know, everybody wants to be like, oh, right. You're the king of motivation. I'm like, no, that's not the case at all. I promise you that. I struggle like everybody else. But in those dark moments, I try and reach out and help someone else. And that gives me the sensation of meaning and fulfillment to keep, to maintain a relatively um, a strong positivity in life, for sure. Yeah. I, think, I think the more we help other people, uh, the more we feel... Uh, a, a genuine sensation of meaning in our own lives. It's, and, and when, and I don't know, yeah. there's been a great study done. Harvard University conducted this really phenomenal study. It's one of the longest social studies, uh, science studies of its kind. Went on for like 76 years and they track a graduating class from Harvard and then a bunch of inner city poor kids from Boston over this long period. It had four different um, 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 uh, curators of this <laughs> and what ultimately came out of this, and they would ask questionnaires send to these people twice a year to their families. And rather, regardless of whether you did really well in life or horrible, struggled with drugs, alcohol, were imprisoned or you know, were loaded or just even middle of the ground, the ultimate concept that came out of it is that most people towards the end of their lives had hoped that they had spent more time cultivating valuable relationships. And so there's a component that I think most most human beings, obviously, there's a subset of, of, of psychopathology or sociopathology that is always the inescapable. Right? There's sure. always there's there's always a group of people that struggle no matter what with mental health issues, right? Um, but the overwhelming majority of people, if you if you dedicate your life towards strong relationships, now and that is a wide spectrum of what that actually means, or, or you understand. But there's definitely a core component of that that. If you're positive to people and you help people, you'll feel a reciprocal sensation yourself. And, and that's been proven mm -hmm. not just with that study from a social science study, but also neurologically, um, you know, the, the human mind uses about 20% of your energy is used with your brain, your cognitive energy. And, and, and it's a pretty small little organ, but it's really maxing out your energy levels. And then a subset of this, the study that they did found that it takes about three times the cognitive energy to address negative emotion than it does positive emotion, right? Yeah. So you're exhausting yourself uh, and not and generating more fear by processing negative emotion on a regular basis than flipping around, having generating positive emotion, mm -hmm. feeling that sensation of not necessarily pure happiness or pure joy because those are fleeting emotions like everything else. But it's a grander sensation that I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'm helping someone else, just like you do every day in, in, in your profession, right? You are, you are the, the, the stewards of, of, of people that have worked their whole lives to accumulate wealth or however you want. I don't, I don't yeah. like to use the term wealth per se because it's, it's deeper than that, right? Yeah. It, it's a person's life work, right? Mm -hmm. a, a person's um, um, 
ability to transfer their life's work to their, their, their children or philanthropically, mm -hmm. that's a massive undertaking. So you help people do that every day. So innately in, in what you're bringing to people is a positive aspect. It's protecting yeah. their life's work. So uh, you know, do you feel a profound sense of meaning by doing that? Yeah, we, we absolutely do. And our mission is we're helping people live fulfilling lives. Amen. Right? And that's different for everybody. What fulfills you is different, but you know, at the end of the day, you want to look back on your life and go, I used the time, I used my resources, I used my wealth or whatever it is to where it really fulfilled you as a, as a person. And it's much deeper than just the, the Oh, money, it's, money it, there's so many more layers. I, you know, yeah. the, the ultimately the, the, what we all want to get to in life for sure is, is we want to have purpose, right? We want to have a purpose. Yeah. And, and when I meet people that are really struggling with that, and these are people that have been professional athletes, they've had huge businesses, or they've been in special operations, and they, they, they end those chapters right and then they move on and they have this cataclysmic mm -hmm. you know energy shift or identity shift and it's like all right well, what purpose do i fulfill now what do i do next and i always have those people start if they can't figure it out through some of the exercises we do i always say all right what i want you to do is just go help someone else go sign up for Habitat for Humanity, go start, uh, go work with a charity, mm -hmm. go find a, a friend of yours that's in the depths of, of a profound never quit moment and help them through that and see what type of feeling that you feel from that. And that's a great starting point to, to try and recalibrate what your purpose might be in your life. Yeah, I think everybody comes back to helping others. I think so, I, I think yeah. if you want, I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not conclusively there yet, yeah. uh, but I'm, I'd say I'm about 95% of the way that yeah. that's the core of, 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 of why we're here in, in the limited time that we have is, is to engage with other people in a manner that uh, makes them better and makes you better. That's it. Well, I'm better for having you as a guest on the show here. I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thanks for tuning in for uh, this episode of Value Exchange Podcast. David, thanks for being here.